goal is to finish up this um, existence of Morse functions by chart by chart that I claim exists. Um, I think it's sort of easier than I've been hinting at. So, um, so, so here's what I here's what I want what I want to say is I want to say that um, given given the uh, of all the, um, let, let's, let's just make a ball be um, a radius r. This is inside r, inside rn, right? So it's a chart, but we're just going to think of it inside rn, right? Okay? And the function f from d to r. So the first thing we know is we are, I, I claim that we already know that there exists some function g for d to r. It's actually going to be a linear function. Um, such that for all t between 0 and epsilon, for some small epsilon, uh, the function f plus gt is worse. That, that I claim we already know. And that's, you, you know, the, 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 way, the way we prove this is when Morse is replaced with d of this equal, it, it's transverse to the zero section. But we're just over in a chart. So the, the, we're looking at the zero section of the cotangent bundle. But the cotangent bundle of a ball is trivial. So it's just the cotangent bundle, you know, t star of b, we just think of as equal to b cross rn. And then what we want to do is say that, um, so, so now we think of the D of, of F as being a map from D into D cross R. And the zero section, and so um, you know, the zero section is B cross zero. We want that to be transverse. I'm, just, I'm sort of just reminding you what we do before. We want this to be transverse to B cross zero. And so, what I'm saying is that actually just by moving it, so it, the, the, a general way to set up the transversality argument is in this case, we think of this actually as a bundle over Rn. And so one, one version of transversality says if you have any manifold mapped into a, into a bundle, you can, um, uh, that's right, mapped into a bundle, we, um, so B cross, if you think of it as a bundle over Rn, then B cross zero is a fiber. Okay? And if you have any map, map into a bundle, then for a dense set of fibers, uh, they're, they're, they're dense, it, any map would be transverse to a dense set of fibers. So in other words, what, what I really want to say is that I can push DF, you know, now, now it's just a map from B into B cross Rn, I can, I can, uh, um, I can, find some fiber close to the zero section that is transverse to it, right? So the claim is um, we want it transverse, and sort of general transversality theorem says that what I really want to say is that um, there exists a vector V in R in, such that uh, df is transverse to not d cross zero, but d cross the um, d cross t v. For the, so there's some direction in which you can move v b cross t v um, uh, for all t. So you're just going to move. It, so there's some direction in which you can displace the fiber. And you can find so it's some. So, so generic, generically it's transverse to fibers is what I'm saying. It's not transverse to a particular fiber, it's a direction in which you can move it, so that uh, arbitrarily small in that direction, and you can get um, transverse to this fiber. So this is, a, this is one formulation of transverse theory, transversality theorem that you can find elsewhere. And so now, because we're doing everything over a chart, this is, we're, we're moving B cross TV is, we can think of that as saying DF plus um, or minus B is transverse to B cross zero. That, but this is just a constant, this is V is just a vector in the in Rn, which is the cotangent bundle direction. So 
So this is the same thing as e, this equals d of f plus t times some function g, and g is actually a linear function. g is linear, and dg equals this vector. Okay. Um, okay, but now what I want to do, so that, that we already know, and what I want to say next is, so the sort of the improved version, Um, if we're also given some compact set K um, uh, contained contained the on which DF is already F is already Morse. So DF, I'm going to replace Morse by DF transverse to Z. Z is the zero section of the cotangent bundle, and DF transverse to Z is equivalent to Morse. Um, then I want to argue that, um, let's say, then uh, well, well, maybe backing up a little bit, I could have, suppose I wanted to change F by adding um, something that damps out to zero on the boundary of this ball. So I could have talked about f plus g times, let's say, beta t, where beta is a bump function on the ball B, such that beta restricted to, um, you know, the, the, uh, let's call this it's capital F. Okay. Beta restricted to the ball of radius um, r or 2 or something is equal to 1, right? So then I could damp that out. The problem is, so that, that will arrange, I'll have this, this nice Morse thing inside the ball of radius uh, R2, but the question is what about you know, where the bump function is, is slowing down, right? So this will be then D of F plus, I don't want the T there, I want the T up front, T beta G. Okay, beta is this bump function. D of F plus T beta G is going to be Morse uh, it's transverse to the zero section um, when uh, on on uh, when the radius r is less than or equal to two. Okay, so that's fine. So if, if if for some reason I wanted to not move things outside the ball, which is what we're going to do, it would be patch by patch argument. This is great for getting a transverse inside the small ball. But what I want to do now is. Suppose I've already got a compact set K inside somewhere inside this whole P. Um, the claim is then uh, there exists um, this bump function B, function B, or beta, um, and this and this G, um, such that uh, two things: one, A, D of F plus T times the bump function times G is transverse um, to the zero section on um, the ball of radius uh, R2, this is the ball of radius R, and also, well, D of F plus T G is transverse to the zero section on K. So the point is K might might go out presumably will go outside this ball of radius R2. Okay. So the, this is this is set up to deal with the fact that if I have a bunch of balls charged on which I'm doing this, I have charts set up so that actually they are charts of radius R for various R, but each one has a property that the, the actual the ball of radius R over two, if I take the ball of radius R over two in all of them, that still covers the manifold. Okay, you can always do that. And so then I've got these these pieces that cover the manifold. Radius R2, and now if I've already done it here, right, I've already got it transverse to the zero section here, then I want to make it transverse to the zero section here, but not screw up the fact that it's also transverse to the zero section here. So this would be my, this for, for this ball, radius R, this would be my K here, be this piece, and there's, I'm going to improve it over here, but I don't want to mess it up there. The point is, if I can prove this, if I can prove this, then we're done. We just go step by step. Okay. Um, and um, 
we, but we, we, you know, just this this fact alone is not good enough because um, this g is not guaranteed to damp out to zero. But now with the bump function, it damps out to zero, so we can patch these together. So that's that. And the argument then is going to be um, the following: I'm going to, um, I am going to need some measure of non-transversality, um, or measure, I guess, measure of transversality, um, and. But let, let's just think about this thing, d of f plus t theta g. Well, that's df, and then t times d of that, so it's t times beta times dg plus t times g times t theta. Okay. So d beta is the wild card, right? That's that's the, the thing that, that might screw us up, and that's why I kept saying, you know, we got this how how steep of a bump function are you dealing with, right? That we, we have no, we have no control. We know that this part, this much here, is going to be transferred to the zero section, but we have no idea about that. Okay. Um, and of course, there, but when, the other thing to remember is that if this thing is already transferred to the zero section, yes, it's true that this one can be transverse to the zero section, but it could be less transverse, right? I mean, basically what I'm thinking of is a measure of transversality is you could, you could literally put a Riemannian metric on your manifold x, right? And then, or you could just use the Euclidean metric here, right? Then you've got a, a Riemannian metric on the manifold that gives you a metric on the cotangent bundle, and then you, uh, you know, you just measure actual, angle. let's say, minute, if you've got two, two, sub, two linear subspaces of the tangent space or a Riemannian manifold, then there's an, a minimal angle between them, just the minimal angle between all any two vectors, and then that angle, um, if that angle is non-zero, that's what transverse means. Okay? If that angle is zero somewhere, then they're not transverse. In, in, in these dimensions where, I mean, transverse, in, in this dimension where transverse actually means literally independent, linearly independent. Because in this dimension, we're looking at, a, you know, Two things of half dimension being transverse in the total space. So therefore, it's you know the only way they can be transverse is if they're linearly independent. Um, you could also think about that measure of uh, non -tra of transversality. How how transverse you are is taking. I've got I've got a uh, I've got the zero section, zero section. I've got fibers, right? And then I've got something running through here, and I want to know how non-transverse is how transverse is this, right? One thing you do is just take a unit, you know, take take all unit vectors in that space and project them onto the fiber direction, and then that's actually a, just you know take the length of that, right? And that'll be you know the length of the projection on the fiber direction. That's like sine of the angle, right? And that'll be um, a decent measure of, of that transversality. We want that. We want to bound that. But the point is then. Um, we know that, uh, so if, uh, you know, df is transverse enough, right, you know, in other words, if on, oh, because, and, and because k is compact, right, because k is compact, we, the, the, this measure of transversality is bounded below. It's, tra it's, it's, it's transverse, so it's not, it's not zero everywhere, but on this compact set, there's a minimum, there's a lower bound, right? So k is transverse enough, and therefore, um, then for small enough t, adding something to it, right, is still going to be transverse. A adding t this is just t times something, right? So I could have written it this way. The whole thing, uh, a, a way, you know, on, on the, I mean, I, I sort of emphasize that this is the wild card, but, um, you know, this sort of played a role too, so this is transverse, this could conceivably make it a little less transverse, and then, uh, here, and then here comes the wild card. So you really have to use both of them, right? But anyway, you've got the multiplied by t, but for small enough t, um, d of f plus t g uh, is still transverse. You know, you, now the small enough t means you just figure out some way to bound the what that does to things, right? And it's it's just I, I think thinking of projection on the vertical axis is is good in a way because that then you can see that really you are dealing with, with something linear, right? And uh, so if you add um, something to this, you're going to turn it by some small amount, but if it's small enough, it'll keep it'll keep you away from zero by the amount. Now, of course, the point is 
you'll get the in the, in the end you'll get um, yourself to be so this was on this was on this we had already and then for all for all um, for all t between zero and epsilon now we're gonna have to change, make that epsilon smaller right because we don't want to make things, we don't want to go too far to screw up the terms of stuff. that's all that says and then you know as you go to the next chart you're gonna have to make epsilon even smaller and keep going but you've got now this is where my argument really needs it to be a compact manifold okay because um, I want to do it I want to do it finite many times. Of course, if it's not a compact manifold, but it's locally compact, which it should be, it's probably okay, because what you would probably do is you'd have a finite, you take your infinite cover, div divide it into a finite, uh, a finite set of subsets of cover, you know, all of which are disjoint, right? So you can sort of do it on all of these ones first, which are all disjoint. And then you've got another part of your cover. So you've got like, you divide your infinite cover into 10 parts, right? And in each of those 10 parts, you've got um, the, the, all, all the covers are disjoint. Okay, so you do this, and this, and this, and this. You do all of these all at once, right? Infinitely many of those. And then you do all of these. So those are supposed to be just have all of those. Infinitely many. You do all, all of those all at once. You use, well, the compactness, I guess getting the bound of T might be wrong. Anyway, I don't care about the compact manifolds. Um, lots of people do, of course. And if you want to do infinite dimensional stuff, you have to be much more careful. That's all I want to say. Okay. New topic. I decided to try and uh, sketch the proof of the H board. Um, and uh, I think I will give you. Uh, okay, so the, the proof gets harder the lower the dimension gets, and so in the sense of what, what I'm going to do is keep the dimensions high to keep it easy. Okay, um, and uh, the, you know the, the proof in four dimensions is much 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 harder. That's you know, Friedman only works the top logical category. I'm not going to do the smooth age coordinates. So let me state the theorem. Okay. Theorem says if um, x, well, let me just define an h coordinate um, definition. A uh, coordinate x is an n-dimensional coordinate from n minus one manifold. And zero to another n minus one one is an h coordinate if the two inclusions m zero included into x and m one included into x are homotopy equivalences. This means. There should be, these are, these are just given maps, but there's also a map from x back to m0 and a map from x back to m1, such that the compositions are homotopic to the identity. Okay? Um, so an example of an h coordinate is a product. Okay? And then you just include and then you project back. Okay? Um, and the claims that simply connected h coordinates are actually diffeomorphic products. Um, in, uh, In high enough dimension. So, here is that um, in N, I, uh, uh, six, I think it was actually true, but I will pay attention as to whether I really go down to six. I may need the higher dimension still to keep track of things. If N is greater than equal to six, and then uh, and X N. Okay, 
and in particular, M1 is diffing morphic too. So uh, this is proved by snail. Um, and a consequence of that is that if, uh, <clears throat> so if you have something which is um, homotopy equivalent to a sphere, if, if you have some corollary, if let's say x prime is homotopy equivalent to um, to s n, <clears throat> then you can remove two balls from it. Okay, then so this is smooth manifold. Then x prime minus two balls is an h coordinate is a simply connected. H cobordism from uh, from a sphere of dimension n minus one to a sphere of dimension n minus one. Okay, and uh, therefore its product. Okay, <coughs> therefore um, uh, x. Uh, let's call this x. Taking such a thing and gluing balls in on either end. Okay. And it turns out that that's not quite enough to conclude it's diffeomorphic to a sphere because of the fact that you can, there are non, non trivial, interesting non trivial ways to glue. But you can glue one ball, one of the balls in at one end, and then sort of use that to, you know, so a ball with a collar glued onto it's just a ball. So it's diffeomorphic to B and BN with some gluing map. And so then uh, you can prove that, uh, therefore, you can prove that x prime is homeomorphic to that same. And that the reason is that you've got you you this thing is all, is almost diffeomorphic to to S N right to glue two balls glued together and you can what. I mean, I'm not going to do the details of this, but the point is, you can you can make it diffeomorphism all the way to the center of the last of the top. You got two balls glued together, right? You can make one ball bigger and bigger and bigger. So then, eventually, it's well. What you really could say is, it's homeomorphic to a ball unit point. Okay, and so so you can you can um, it's a one point compactification of a ball, which is homeomorphic to S N. But the smooth subtlety is that you know going all the way into that point, you know you can lose track of differentiability. And in fact, that's what happens in higher dimensions. So dimension seven and higher exotic, exotic spheres, which are precisely obtained by gluing balls together with sort of interesting diffeomorphisms from this n minus one to itself. Um, but anyway, that, so that's that you know, higher dimensional Planck ray conjecture, um, which is now proof. So, so I want to try to sketch the proof of this h coordinate theorem. There is sort of still active research in understanding what this says when it's not simply connected and it's very closely related to group theory. Because you know the, what kinds of groups, for what kinds of fundamental groups is this theorem true? Um, there, uh, I, I don't know anything about that field really, but there's sort of an active bit of research about that. Um, okay, so so the, the proof. Yeah. There's two steps. The first thing is to, um, uh, well, we're going to, step zero is put a Morse function on X. And that gives Henry the composition. And the goal now is to cancel all of the handles. Okay, if we cancel all the handles, then it's a product. That's how it works. So, um, 
step one is going to be to trade one handles for three handles. Without, now we did some trading before where we actually did a, actually change the manifold. When I was doing that, uh, um, the curvy calculus there, we, were, we, were, we got rid of one handles, but we didn't care about whether we were changing the manifold, so it was sort of a little easier. We just wanted some coordinates from something else to something else, we said we'd get rid of one handles. Here we don't want to change x, we want to prove x as a product. So I need to show that I can assume, I can assume that this Morse function has no index one critical points, and the way I'll do it is some operation that replaces one handles for three handles, um, and this uses simple connectivity. Because if you're going to get something that doesn't have any one handles in it, right? The only way to, then one handles are the only thing that generate pi one. Well, actually, that's not true. You can also, in a coordism, you can also have fundamental group coming just from the bar, right? I mean, M zero could be a circle, right? Cross I is still something connected. Right so you can get you can get a fundamental group from the bottom M zero or from one handle. But we're assuming everything's simply connected, so we want to get rid of one handles. And then the next thing is going to be um, to uh, algebraically um, simplify the um, algebraically simplify the handle decomposition. And so what algebraically simplify is going to be that actually we're going, to we're going to modify the or actually or the Morse function. We're going to modify the Morse function using this is all going to use Hamlet's lines. So that if we look at the Morse chain complex, it's as simple as possible, which means that it's going to have the either the boundary of every of every uh, critical point for every handle is zero, or it's exactly equal to another handle. Okay? So in other words, the, so the bound, therefore the boundary maps of the chain complex are all in the form of like this. For all i, boundary maps are in the form, you know, identity and zero. Uh, for all boundary maps, or you know, maybe commuted, but for all boundary maps. So this means that every, all this means is algebraically it looks as if there's one, it, the, all, the, all the critical points are paired off with one flow line from one to the next, and of course if there's a flow line from here to here, then there's no flow lines going out, because, and, and, and so on. Right? So it's going to look algebraically as if everything cancels and there's just one flow line from each. So algebraically it looks like you can cancel all the critical points. But, that just means al the difference between algebraic and geometric is that you may have Kent's, you may actually have two flow lines that, that from one critical point to another with an opposite sign, and so then we want to show the geometric. We want to show how to um, fit that uh, step three is to geometrically cancel. Um, flow lines of opposite sign. And this is going to use finger moves. And we're going to use simple connectivity to get there. Uh, one thing I should say is this being <coughs> this thing of being a homotopy equivalent, what we're really going to use, we're going to use that um, the whole thing is simply connected, M0 is simply connected, and that the all the homology is trivial. So if the homology is one of the theorems is that um, Yeah, if you have a map between spaces that in, induces uh, isomorphisms on all the homotopy groups, then it is a homotopy equivalent. Spaces with isomorphic homotopy groups are not necessarily homotopy equivalent, but if there's a map that induces isomorphism, then it's a homotopy equivalent. And so we've already got the map M0 into X. And if, if, if X is simply connected, and has trivial homology. Okay. Um, right, well, I'm going to prove this in the case where well, anyway, but the, the point is we're, we're, we're really just going to use the fact that the homology 
Uh, yeah, you know, I'm being a little, I think I'm going to prove this only in the case where m0 is actually equal to the sweep. Okay? Because um, I don't want to think, there, there's, I've been talking about the homology J complex, right? And in that case, I was always, you know, I was talking about the Morse complex, I was always dealing with a closed manifold, right? Now, suppose you have a cobordism, you sort of have homology coming from the bottom, and then you have the homology coming from the the, the handles, right? And so that's a more complicated situation to do this chain complex in. But if the bottom is, has no homology to begin with, so it's a sphere, for example, then you, you, you know the homology, the homology, the whole thing really is just given by these um, special maps. So um, anyway, you, you'll you'll see what happens. Um, okay. So, but when when we cancel these flow lines, we're going to use um, finger moves, which are So I think I will talk about um, the, the, the reason we need to get rid of one handles first is they, um, this finger move operation gets much more complicated in that setting. So we want to stay away from, it's all about staying away from low dimensions. And just to give you a heads up, the, reason, the whole reason high dimensions, we like, we like high dimensions, is that mapped in disks, if you have a, a continuous map from a disk into something high dimensional, then you can perturb that map to be a smooth embedding. In dimension four and lower, a smooth a mapped in disk can be perturbed to be smooth, continuously mapped in disk can be perturbed to be smooth, but it will general gen it will in general intersect itself, have self intersections. But if you're counting dimensions, you know it's the, the it's just about making it transverse to itself, right? And so you know, the, the question of how, how it's going to intersect itself is the same thing as how do two two-dimensional things intersect. And in general, two-dimensional things intersect in points in a four-manifold. Two-dimensional things inter don't intersect at all, trans you know, if they're transverse in five, to five dimensions or higher. So we're always going to use whatever high dimensions we need to make sure the mapped-in disks are smoothly embedded. So there, there's a bunch of different ways to, to say this. Um, uh, actually, what this is I trade one handles for three handles, and I think well, it's, it's sort of going to be um, sort of and n minus one handles. I'm not sure if this is, can't remember right now when we need this, but I think no, I think this will be important for n minus two handles because when you turn things upside down. I had minus three handles. You turn things upside down, you can do the same argument there. Okay. Now, of course, if you were in demand, if you were in low, if, if n was equal to four, and you traded your one handles for three handles, and then traded your three handles for one handles, you get back where you started, right? So that's another reason. There's, there's one more case where you want to stay away from the handles four. Um, okay. So let's get rid of our one handles first, and. Um, the, the, the what we want to do is is um, we use simply connected. We can use the fact that um, uh, we get a, the the one handles and the two handles give us a presentation of which of pi one of x. We already know which is equal, which is trivial. Okay. Presentation of the trivial. Now, everyone understand what I mean by that? I mean, saying that, why I say that. So, you've got, you know, if, if you were to compute pi, you know, it's a cell complex. It's homotopy equivalent to a cell complex. You, you've got just, there's no, no fundamental group coming from F0. The only loops you get are from these one handles, and then the two handles run over them to provide relations. So, the one handles give generators. And then two handle goes wraps around lots of different one handles some number of times, and then that means that whatever you read off what one handles it goes goes over, and whatever one handles it goes over, that gives you 
uh, or that's that's trivial in the fundamental group because it bounds the disk now because the two handle went over it. So the two handles give you relations. Okay, so we've got a presentation, a finite presentation of the trivial group. Now, finite presentations of the trivial group can re be reduced to, so the, what I want to do is I want to reduce these to the trivial presentation of the trivial group. Okay. Um, a, a trivial presentation, by which I mean a tri pre presentation of the form of the generator, you know, n generators, and each generator is the identity. Okay. Um, and so, what can we do? Well, um, I, I think I'll do an example. Uh, there are sort of moves that you can do when you, uh, um, on presentations. So presentation is in the form of G1 up to GK, and then relations R1 up to Rn. Each of these is a word in these generators. And, and that means that that word is the end. Um, Their moves, I think they're called the Tietze moves. Um, and they're the following. Um, so, I, I, I know this down. Sure. so you can take any relation, you can take any relation, and you can replace it with its inverse. Okay. You can uh, take any relation and you can replace it with one relation times another. Um, of course, you can always, you know, these relations are words with cancellation. So if you see generator, generator, inverse, you just immediately cancel. I'll have to write that down. And then any relation, you can take any word you want, and put it in front of the relation, and then put that same uh, word on the back of the relation. Um, and you can also add, add a new generator, generator, GM times 1, and then you add the relation that I'll write it this way, W, GM plus 1, for any word, for any word, W in G1, GM. So in other words, you just, you know, you pick your favorite word, whatever, and then you say, that's equal to a new generator. That doesn't really do anything, right? But that might be useful, you want to throw that in. And the claim is that you can always reduce this uh, presentation, if it is a presentation of the trivial group, you can reduce it to a presentation using these moves. So now, but I'm, should be, I'm being a little sloppy about what I mean by these moves. So these moves suffice to, to Now, let me, let me give an example that, that illustrates the sense in which I'm being sloppy. The sense in which I'm being sloppy is, are, should you allow yourself to remember relations? There are two ways you can interpret these moves. One is, if you do this move, you throw away Ri, and you replace it with Ri inverse. If you do this move, you throw away Ri and replace it with Rij. That Rirj. That's not what I mean. You're, you are allowed to remember your relations. Um, and can remember relations. And um, this is important because there's a famous conjecture called the Andrews Curtis conjecture, which says that the conjecture is you can do it without remembering, without remembering relations. Anytime you do this move, you throw away the relate the relation you used to have, and you keep the new one. And I want to show you sort of show you geometrically what, what that means. And this remembering relations is going to be going to correspond to where, I, that's where our three handles are going to come from. Did you, when you say that, I mean, R-I can be part of a lot of different uh, relations. So no, 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 R-I is one of the oh, relations. Okay, okay. okay, these R's are, W's are arbitrary words okay. that can be okay. anywhere. R's are one of your given list of relations, and then that should be a K. Andrews number. Actually, no, the, the Andrews Curtis conjecture is that if it's a balanced presentation, which means same number of generation relations. And then you can get back to the trivial presentation without remembering relations. 
you need it, obviously need it to be, to be balanced because in the end, the trivial presentation is balanced. It has one generator, one relation. You know, generator G1, relation <coughs> okay. um, And uh, there's an interesting relationship between Andrews Curtis conjecture and the four dimensional smooth, smooth point break conjecture that I'll talk about at some point. But for now, um, I mean, let's just do an example. Just so a nice, a nice example is um, here's a famous presentation of a trivial group it's x and y of generators, and the relations are x y x equals y x y, and x to the fifth equals y to the fourth. If you've seen this with presentation before, it's kind of a nice one. You, the, as far as no, any, no one has figured out a way to do this without remembering relations. And so what, what do you, you know, why is this the trivial group? It's not so easy to see, so I sort of cheated and looked, looked up the group. But, um, so you know, you, the first thing you do is you say, well, okay, y is equal to, we, we just rewrite this relation. So this is going to correspond to conjugating with a, with a, with a word, but I'm just rewriting it as uh, yx inverse x, y, x. Um, and now we're going to take that relation and raise it to the power of 5. Okay. So then we get yx minus 1, x to the fifth, yx, right? Because if you, you know, we've got a yx and a yx inverse, right? So everything, you know, that's just a conjugate. Now, right away, I've, when I say raise it to the power of 5, I'm remembering relations, right? Because I'm using this that I can take ri and replace with ri times ri. You know, if I get ri squared, you know, so I can go from ri to ri squared, okay? And then I can go from ri squared to ri to the fourth, but how do I get ri to the fifth without remembering ri, okay? Um, and uh, anyway, then, then you go from, now you use the relation that uh, x to the fifth equals y to the fourth, you get y x minus one, uh, y to the fourth, y x. Okay, that, that's, that's legal, so here we, Remembering. Here we here we that step we're not remembering. What we're doing really is just uh, well, it's actually also a relation of the, this is some going from here to here is some conjugate combination of conjugating and then multiplying two relations times each other. Okay. Um, how uh, you know this, if you set it up right again? I'm saying equal. Really, you should you should put everything on one side and just write a word and say that's equal to the identity. Figure out what I'm doing. Um, now this this is x to the minus one. Y to the minus one. So then this simplifies as x to the minus one. Y to the fourth x. Um, and uh, what did I want to do now? Uh, right. And then that's x at y to the fourth. Now this one is y to the fourth is x to the fifth. Now again, I'm remembering that relation, right? So that's x to the minus one, y, x to the fifth, uh, x. And so here I remember. Right, because here I used the relation once and I didn't throw it away. Well, actually, you could, I guess maybe I didn't have to remember here because um, I was, maybe I was modifying this relation, right? But not modify. So yeah, I kept that relation. To I used that mod that relation to modify this relation, but I kept it. With me. So that's not I'm not remembering there. And then this is x to the um, fifth, and that's the same as y to the fourth. So finally, you concluded that y to the fifth equals y to the fourth, and so then you can get uh, y to the one. I guess really it's the it's the raise of the power of five that was the critical problem, and that is what we call it. Okay, I just did that long example to illustrate the point. It's 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 an open problem as to whether that can be reduced with with our own keeping. With based all along, you've got to have as many relations as generators. So, and, okay, so so now the question is how how is that going to help us um, uh, change eliminate one nickels and uh, so. Let's look at each of these moves. So suppose, so look, what do these moves have to do with the handle decomposition? So a relation corresponds to a two-handle, 
And so the move ri goes to r inverse, that actually doesn't have anything to do with changing the, the handle decomposition. It just changes the orientation of that generator. So this is no change in handle decomposition. What about ri goes to ri rj? What do you think that corresponds to? So I've got a, it's a hand slide. So I've got RI is a two handle, RJ is a two handle. Now I'm slide RI over RJ, and now the word it reads out in the one handles is everything it used to read out, followed by everything that RJ went over. Okay? So this is slide handle, let's say handle I, that's a two handle over handle J. Okay? Say H is H is on the handles. Um, and then uh, R I goes to W R I inverse. Actually, that that's also no change because that's really just a change of base points, right? So that's not that's a, a change of base point or just yeah. You know, it's every, every you know in order to get yeah. You know, it's important to remember that in order to get this presentation, you need you've got your two handle and then it's attaching circle doesn't read out a well-defined word in the generators until you connect some point on it to the base point and changing that arc. So this is just a base point, uh, base point issue. Um, what about adding a new generator? So that adding you know, add generator relation. That corresponds to Perth and canceling pair, right? So that's a perf. And of course, the W in that, I mean, you could, the relation could just be, yeah, GK plus 1 and GK plus 1. But then what about the word? Well, the point is that your new two handle, that you, you know, when you attach this one handle, I mean, you attach this canceling pair, you remember I talked about this briefly, sort of that the, um, the two feet of the one handle are somewhere, right? And then there's an arc between them, which is, you know, the new two handle that cancels it goes up and over at once, and um, they're, con they're connected by an arc. That arc could then go over other one handles, and that's this W. So this is the first pair. Now, if you just do these things, slide and burst, the point is when you do this move, you lose RI, and you get RIJ. So how do you remember? So the cr critical thing is, how do you remember? Canceling two three pair. Okay, so this is the. Um, let's see if I can draw a picture. So imagine. Um, well, let me do something very simple first. Imagine a two handle that's not actually attached. I'll, I'll keep the dimension small, much lower than it, and, and there's actually no no generator to run over here at the moment. But suppose this is a two handle. Okay. So this is our two handle. Which I, I'm going to split that into two two handles and a three handle in the following way. So I'm going to um, this. So there's two different ways to think. One, one. So I could say, let me now put in a a ball that looks like this. So I'm going to carve out a ball inside there. You can sort of see this solid ball in here. And now what you can see is that I'm attaching this single two handle. It's the same as attaching two two handles, one here and one just outside of it, and then filling in with a three handle in between them. So this single two handle can be replaced with a two handle and a canceling two three pair. Okay. Another way to say it, if you don't like that, is to say that you've got the single two handle you start out with one two handle, attach like that, and now you attach a canceling two three pair. So there's the three handle inside of it, and then you slide this two handle over that two handle. So you slide this over that, right? and then you get to this picture. But the point is, the new two handle you've created reads off exactly the same relation the original two handle did. Does that make sense? 
Okay. I mean, another way, to, maybe even easier way to say it is attaching a 2-3 pair all by itself, far away from anything, introduces the relation 1. Okay? The identity. And now, you've got that relation, and you can use this move to turn 1 into any other relation you want to remember that relation. Okay? So, therefore, you can take that. That forces in that. So you use a two three pair. Okay. So the claim is now that by um, using all those moves, you can eventually get to the point where um, the the actual word read off by each. Um, oh, actually, there's there's one other. Maybe I suppressed one thing. There's one other move, which is. Um, uh, which, which, which I, I said was not, we didn't really talk, want to talk about, but it's if, if in one of the relations I see, it's just this, if I see gi, gi inverse inside a word, then I replace that with, with one, right? Um, what does that correspond to? Well, that means literally you go over gi, and then you come back and you go over it again, and now that is a finger move, right? So um, you're not going... So we need to know that we've got um, so this final finger move. So I guess we're out of time. So let me just talk about that um, quickly next time, and then move on to the next thing. But the point is, when we do all these moves, we're going to eventually get to the point where each two handle runs over one one handle. And that's it, and then we can cancel all the. Of course, we had. We might have had. Uh, I don't want to. We're not necessarily going to get rid of all the two handles now, because we may have way more two handles than one handle. Right? And we also have two handles that aren't involved in the presentation at all. Right? That two handles generate H2 or pi2 or something like that that then get killed by higher things. But all the two handles that are sort of involved in this relation eventually pair off with, I mean, another way to say is we'll, we'll get it down to a relation which has generator 1 up to n, relations 1 up to n, which are just each of those generators because they identity, and then a whole bunch of other relations which are just 1. But they're, they're, we can't throw them away because they are two handles that are important for the structure of x. Right? Um, so I'll, I'll try to summarize that next time, say what the finger move is, and, sh and therefore show how we can find actually geometrically cancel the ones at the expense of creating the threes. <laughs>